question that actually came up in a previous webinar. Who owns my nonprofit, our nonprofit? A nonprofit, right? We're going to dig into that question because I think that there's some useful things to gain by answering this question. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Livieri. I'm a number one international bestselling author, former executive director, and creator of the Impact Method. And I love helping nonprofits change the way they operate so that they can make a bigger impact without getting overwhelmed or burning out. And there's nothing more fundamental to thinking about how should we be operating our nonprofits than answering this question, who owns your nonprofit? So let's dive right in. We're gonna start with the definition of owning something, right? You can have it or hold it as property or you can have power or mastery over it. And I think the key thing here for us today is to think about power. Now, because of regulations of the government, right? Our nonprofits cannot be treated like property. That's the big difference between a for-profit and a nonprofit. A for-profit can be treated like property and you can actually sell pieces of it in exchange for money. A nonprofit, you can hire people to work for it, but you can't sell off a piece of it for money. So basically by being a nonprofit, it means that our organizations can't be property themselves. So we're really looking at definition B of who, who has power over our nonprofit. So I love to see in the chat, you know, who, who has the power, do you think, in your nonprofit? Who has the ultimate say um, in your nonprofit? Go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, so legally, the board is kind of by the state that you are incorporated in bestowed this power on day one, complete and total power over the ongoings of the nonprofit. But the thing about the board and the way it works is the board has the power to kind of designate and turn this power over to any one person or a group of people, or they can split up the power however they want, which really says the power could be in anybody's hands. So who should, who should have the power? Essentially, we, whoever's on a board, initially especially, gets to decide who should have the power. And that's the question I want to try to answer today. <clears throat> so here are some potential candidates for holding the power. If you want to add some to this list for your organization, that's fine. I've kept a little general. You can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, if there's one here that's really relevant for you that isn't here, you know, is it the community at large? the community the organization lives in or, or serves in, is it, should it be the board, right? Should it be the board? Should it be the donors? I know there are some um, people, especially in the fundraising world, who say that the donors should have a lot of power. Should it be the management staff or the executive director themselves? Should it be the direct service providers, like the staff in your organization who are actually delivering your programs? Maybe it should be the clients themselves. Maybe they should hold the power. Or what about the volunteers working in your organization? Should they hold the power? I'm wondering as you thought of any of these, were there any ones that you had like a gut yes or a, let's go for a gut no. So go ahead and put it in the chat if you had like list anyone that like your gut just says no. And I know somebody just put something in the Q&A, which I can't see while I'm in presentation mode, but I'm going to come to it at the end or if you want to put it in the chat, I can address it live. So tell me in the chat now, are there any of these that your gut just said no, not them, they shouldn't have the power? Nobody, not volunteers. Interesting that you say that, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> great. Anybody else? Uh, gut reaction said, oh, it shouldn't be them. Uh, not clients, volunteers, or donors. Um, legally, who should not hold the power? I don't know that there are any legal restrictions about who should not hold the power as long as the board has passed the power off. Um, I think legally it's okay. Um, 
You'll have to come back. Uh, so defining the power, uh, I'll review that again in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> the board are volunteers, good point, Calvin. That's what I was thinking. And it's partly why I put volunteers in here because I suspect a lot of people, their guts would say, oh, not the volunteers. And they might say, yes, the board, but aren't the board another set of volunteers? So let's go in and dig in a little deeper. So here's my recommendation. Here's what I know about power and decision making, right? Because what are we really, an organization is just this, it's just an entity of decisions and a group of people, right? Between a group of people collaborating and making decisions, that's most of what your organization is. And when it comes to giving decision making power to people, I always say, give the power to the person or group with the most at risk if the organization fails. In this case, if we're talking about ownership of the whole organization or power over the whole organization, then we're looking at what's at risk if the organization fails. But you could use this rule of thumb kind of in any situation. Who, if the thing goes bad, whatever it is, who has the most to lose? Because the people with the most to lose have the most skin in the game and they're gonna be the most impacted by bad decisions, which means two things. One they're gonna try not to make bad decisions really, really hard. And two, if they do make a bad decision and we're all capable of making bad decisions, nobody you know, knows the future for sure, we're going to experience the result, the negative impact of that bad decision. We're gonna, we're not gonna keep digging a hole. We're gonna change course pretty quickly if we've made a bad decision or a wrong turn. Now, I don't have time today to kind of go through all the stakeholders, and I'm going to let that be an exercise for you to do with the organization, but I do want to take a few examples and work through them together. So let me get out of um, presentation mode here so we can edit. Um, <clears throat> so let's just think about volunteers. I'd love to see in the chat, what do volunteers what do they have to lose? Just our general volunteers if the organization fails. What do they have to lose? Go ahead and put in the chat. I'll put in a few ideas. There's no wrong answers here. Um, they could lose uh, access to, to a community, right? They might be very involved with the community of your nonprofit. Let's make this a little bigger. Um, what else do we have? Connection from the art they love, right? Connection, a feeling of connection or belonging, right? In your case, it's art, but this is true. A lot of volunteers get a sense of belonging, closely connected to this access to community. What else might they lose? Anything? Um, they could, you know, they don't really lose their volunteer position. They could probably, you know, go find another volunteer position if the organization goes under, but they won't necessarily have that same community anymore. Status, yeah, they might lose status. Um, but I would say the thing, oh, that's not status at all. Um, with status, um, they would lose status as a volunteer, but only temporarily, right? Because if your organization goes under, they can just go volunteer at another organization and they still get to say that they volunteered. Um, so I'm going to kind of say yes, status, but that it's really, really kind of a small risk because they can go do that. Um, yeah, unless we're going to talk about board members specifically. So we got a few things, but not really that much I can think of. So I'd say volunteers really don't have a lot of skin in the game. They don't really have a lot to lose. Um, and so I would say I would not, I would not have volunteers own the organization. Let's talk about the executive director. What does the executive director have to lose if the organization fails? That doesn't have to go completely under. Yeah, their job, so their job, right? Which means um, their income, right? So they're, they're probably uh, maybe supporting a family. So that's pretty important. Yeah, reputation, such a good one. Um, and I think the thing about reputation is if they lose their, rep, their job and their reputation, they've lost their career, right? Not just their job, but like 
their whole career. So that's pretty bad. Yeah, reputation, status, career. Um, I'll put status as a separate box, but I think those are very connected. Uh, what else do they lose? Um, I think a lot of executive directors, they feel very responsible. Any CEO feels very responsible for everybody in the organization. Um, so they, they kind of lose all the jobs they were providing or, and the impact they were making. Um, trust of the community. So there's a lot more here, colleagues, I love that. So a lot more here. Um, so this is a lot. This is a lot. Um, they could feel really bad. So they probably they may feel good. Um, they they will feel really bad. Uh, heart, yeah. You know, I think the executive director job is not especially glamorous and. Um, most EDs do it for the love of the mission, like true dedication and their heart is really in it. And so I think, you know, losing their, there's a great sense of personal failure and pain when they don't do the job well. In fact, I was talking to an executive director just the other day who said that their biggest fear was that they've created this organization and their biggest fear is that they're going to somehow mess it up. Right. At any moment, they might they might just blow it and ruin it all. Um, everything that they've put their hard work into. If they're um, a founding executive director or executive director who's really helped grow the organization a lot, too, they might have invested a lot of their own time and money to make it happen and they'll lose their investment. Um, so an investment of time and money. I think a lot of executive directors are, if you count, whether you count their kind of um, underpayment in kind or their personal direct donations, they are often some of the biggest contributors to the organization. Let's move on. So just clearly, right, executive directors have a lot to lose. And I have to say, you know, I'm always a fan of distributing decision making and breaking that down. But if I had to pick one person and not a group of people to own the power over a nonprofit, I put my money on the executive director every time because they have a huge amount at stake. Yeah, founder. Yes, a founder executive director even more so. Let's talk about the board, right? And now the board, remember, defaults to having that power on day one. Um, so what does the board have to lose? The individual board members, right? The, at, as, a, as a group, it's, you know, maybe it's neither here nor there, but as individual um, board members. One of the things that comes to my mind, if usually first, is liability. They have legal liability, but the truth is most boards have insurance um, and there's quite a bit of, you know, they're not, their personal finances are probably never going to come into play and they're probably not going to be, you know, facing jail time or legal fines likely um, unless there's something very specific they did. Um, so we got some, yeah, you know, status maybe, but again, just like that word status, I'm not going to ever spell it right the first time. I think, you know, a board member, if the organization goes under, they can go join another board, right? They're probably not going to be blamed personally for it. Um, whereas, by the way, that ED over there, they're probably going to get blamed for it, even if it wasn't their fault. Um, so they might lose some status, but I'm going to make that a small one again, because I think um, they're, you know, they can regain that status quickly by joining another board and they still get to say that they were a board member. Um, you know, what else? I've got a not much, you know, kind of, yeah, not much. They might feel bad. They might feel bad. Um, what else happens if they really blow it? Yeah, they have, they have insurance against liability. So they're not, even though technically they're liable, they're not, there aren't really any negative consequences um, from acting badly. 
Uh, I'm not coming up with much for boards. You know, they might get stuck, you know, they might get stuck having to do a lot of work, but if they really blow it and the organization closes, um, then, you know, they might end up having to do all the work themselves, right? Unless it closes, in which case they don't. Um, as volunteers, right? Usually they're volunteers, but not always. Um, oh, backstage access. Yes, they might lose, uh, you know, special privileges. Oh, no. Um, so special privileges. Great. Yeah. So not a ton here. So if you're a board member, maybe you really are, put yourself in a board shoes or maybe put yourself in my shoes and a board is asking you, well, you know, what should the roles be? What should we do? What would you advise a board to do? Should they keep the power themselves or should they delegate it away from themselves? Regardless of thinking about where they delegate it to, um, I would say the board, if they want to really, really stay true to that they are safeguarding the organization, then it is their duty to put the power on someone else, to relinquish power themselves. Because in this dynamic, they're just, they're probably gonna make bad decisions. It's not their fault. It's because they don't have a lot of skin in the game. And so it is really the number one most responsible thing they can do is put the power in someone else's hands or a group of people's hands who have a lot to lose. Um, yeah, some, sometimes board members are some of the highest contributing members. We have a comment about them donating a lot of money. So they might lose their, their what they had invested in. Um, I would say that, you know, rather than put this here, I'd say that's true of any major donor, right? So if your board members are also major donors, then they have that to lose. Um, and if you were to fill this out for major donors, then absolutely, um, I would count that as something they could lose. The more money they've invested in the organization, essentially they've lost their investment if the organization doesn't keep going. So what I suggest you do is um, you can take a quick screenshot of this or copy this list down or just quickly make yourself a list of the various stakeholder groups who might hold power over your organization and just do a quick brainstorm. Who has the most at stake? Who has the most to lose? And compare notes and then think about who holds the decision-making power now? And if you realize doing that exercise that it makes sense to shift decision-making power ownership, then you usually need to do that by amending your bylaws and then actually practicing according to those, right? So it's just in your bylaws, your board can just, you know, say, oh, the executive director, we're giving them all the power and then they get to decide how to distribute it even further. Or maybe there's some additional stipulations in there. But that's the simple and basic process for legally um, kind of reassigning power. So that is, I'll leave this up for everybody. That is my training for today. For those of you who are here live, we can go deeper on our Q&A. For those of you watching the recording, I encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me if you wanna talk about this further. And don't forget to like and subscribe as my son and his famous YouTubers would say.